Um, let me see. It's 10.02. Um, <clears throat> let me remind everybody to mute their phones. And um, I guess we're ready to start. So uh, I've got Kevin Crumbo here. Uh, he's the finance director of the Metropolitan Government. Kevin, thank you for being here. I usually start with um, just the totals from the day. Um, latest totals I've got from Davidson County, 5,285 total confirmed cases and 60 deaths. Um, I know we're in phase two. Uh, we've been in phase two for about a week and uh, we'll see how we do. I think the numbers seem to be um, somewhat steady. The, um, I know in the country, <clears throat> we have, um, we reached that horrible milestone of over 100,000 deaths this week. Again, um, the, the George Floyd inc incident in Minneapolis, just horrible and really sad. And obviously there's ramifications from that. Um, so lots of things going on, but Kevin, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're on the phone today. Glad to be with you. All right. So um, let me, um, so um, we're going to obviously talk mainly about the budget and we'll see what kind of questions come in. $2.453 billion budget. A um, couple of questions just to get started. Um, aren't you glad that you took this job or in another way of saying it, is it everything you wanted as Metro's finance director and more? Um, <laughs> we're glad you're doing it, but aren't you glad you accepted this responsibility? Well, I get that question uh, often, as you might expect. And, um, you know, what I've tried to relay to people is that, um, you know, I've only had six months uh, in government so far, and part of that about 30 years or so in uh, corporate uh, restructurings and turnarounds. And I can tell you in that 30 years, it was rare for anyone to call and say, you know, hey, Kevin, we're having a great day. I just wanted you to know about that. Uh, <laughs> it's been uh, more uh, challenges that need to be uh, be addressed. And, you know, when we started out here with the administration, uh, there were plenty of challenges and certainly no phone call from Mayor Cooper, uh, much different than the ones I received in, in corporate life. And so, um, you know, as we've gone through this six months, uh, as you were just saying, the challenges have mounted. Uh, we first needed to address a lot of regulatory issues that uh, you know were existing in October when I got on board, and uh, I think we're pretty successful getting a start on those. But um, just as we were starting to see the fruits of some of that, uh, of course, we had uh, our community hit by the uh, tornadoes, which um, we didn't mention so much at the outset here, and it seems like it's long ago, but uh, that was a major incident here for uh, the community and one that lingers with us still today. And uh, just behind that, of course, is a pandemic. And uh, now we're starting to see the divisiveness over the uh, tragedies there uh, in Minnesota. And so, uh, in all seriousness, the challenges uh, do mount. And uh, I'm hopeful here that we'll all recognize that even though today we're gonna talk a lot about dollars and uh, how we're going to you know, work with our, our constituents and how we're gonna spend our money from a public standpoint, uh, lingering there in the background, I think uh, is the most important issue we need to address of all. And it's one you touched on and that's leadership. Uh, you know, will we develop a, a culture here of good leadership and thoughtfulness uh, as we go about our business? And uh, that's what I'm going to do from my small corner here of, uh, of government. Well, <clears throat> so take take us back for a minute. Okay, so you've been on the job, you know, roughly six months, a little longer than that. Um, here you come. Um, we had thought, at least um, just talking to council members and kind of gauging at the last election, we knew over the last two years that we were in, the, the city's financial situation was not good. And obviously the council got very close last year to um, passing a, a property tax increase. So we kind of expected that we might be looking at the same situation this year. So take us up to, you know, when you came into office and then up to uh, before the tornadoes, before the pandemic hit, what was, what were you all looking at? What did you think might happen? I know um, the mayor came in. I mean, one of the things he ran on was, you know, his financial background and trying to manage this thing. What did it look like? Um, before and with the um, the other caveat, because I know Jason Mumpower is on the phone, the deputy um, comptroller, and we've got Councilmember Rutherford and Councilmember Bradford on the phone. You know, you'd had the comptroller come came down. They were worried about the situation. Here you go. You've got 
you know, you've got a lot of stuff you've got to work on. What did it look like as you were preparing basically to give us a budget a month before you normally did March 31st? What did you think was going to happen at that point? Yeah, so uh, maybe to think about it in terms of a timeline and then just a, a framework for approach. Um, you know, all these years with corporate restructurings, there's, you know, three big questions that uh, you need to start uh, asking from the beginning. And uh, they're pretty simple. Uh, you know, what's happened? Um, what's going on now? And uh, certainly what can be done about it? And so taking those in order in terms of, you know, what's happened, um, I had the very, very good fortune that my uh, predecessor, uh, Talia uh, Max O'Neill, stayed on board with the administration and far and beyond that transition manual and the uh, customary things that may happen from one administration to the other, uh, she was able to walk me through the last several years of history, uh, tell me what had gone well, uh, certainly what had not. Uh, what pleased her, what didn't, and then really be with me uh, this entire time. And so that first question has been fairly easy for me uh, to answer. Uh, You know, amongst those, uh, I think uh, the most common question I get from constituents is, gee, just just how did things get so bad and uh, how they get bad so quickly? And uh, what I tend to tell them is uh, it's maybe not quite as bad as you think, uh, nor did it happen quite so quickly uh, as you might think. And so as I look back on uh, how the government in the last decade has really conducted its affairs, I think we came into, uh, you know, roughly the 2010 era on the heels of a recession and the Dean administration, I think, made very good decisions uh, during its tenure to hold back on property taxes and manage through, you know, a housing crisis uh, itself. And I think uh, with very transparent expectations that perhaps administrations after that would need to raise those taxes and uh, do some things were pretty painful uh, to do in any community, but certainly they didn't feel appropriate in the midst of that uh, recession. And as the years marched on, um, I think each of the other administrations had very good intentions and their own policies and ways of addressing the community. But uh, the phrase I like to use is the facts are our friends. And throughout all that, the facts really are that the community grew and grew. Um, it needed more and more services, but we uh, did not raise property taxes uh, throughout that period of time, uh, nor did our sales taxes and other activity taxes that uh, normally bring revenue to a government uh, rise quite as much as, as we might think. So coming into uh, that October, November time period when the administration was gearing up, that was my view on what had happened. And it certainly had led to a very thin balance sheet. And by that, I mean, we've got a lot of assets, but we have a lot of liabilities too. And the difference between those isn't isn't very much. And uh, we hear this term fund balance used a lot. And it feels a lot like equity in a corporation for those you know looking on from a corporate standpoint. And uh, with that, I think uh, the comptroller just did a marvelous job um, in his role of, of state oversight and saying, hey, you know, Nashville, you've, you've accomplished a great deal. You're a big part of our economy here in Tennessee, but, you know, this balance sheet now is way too thin and um, you waited a lot of years to bring in new revenue and, and now would be the time. And so um, I think we as a community should just be very thankful uh, to have that kind of oversight because not only does it help us here locally, but as we grow and I think overcome those issues, we want all the other counties around us to be well behaved as well. Uh, And when I think about that, I think about at some point, we're probably going to bring around a transit system, things that will integrate our our county and we're going to need good you know solid financials for the other counties uh, as well so uh, my hat's off to the comptroller for doing a good job there uh, coming around the corner uh, to answer your question of you know well, what is it we're going to do about- well let me go back for a minute and then i'm gonna then i'm gonna change it and head right to where you're going so um we had thought again i mean we were preparing the council was preparing as well as the city uh, for you to give us a budget on March the 31st. That was the day of the, uh, the mayor moved up the state of Metro address. Um, it was going to be in the chamber regardless. Uh, and we were planning on getting a budget from you all, um, you know, at the end of March. Um, a lot of things happened. March 3rd, the tornado hit. Here comes the pandemic. Um, I guess the first question would be, were you all ready you all were ready to give us something or you were preparing to give us something at the end of March, correct? I mean, we you were, that's, what your, that's what your goal was. So we would have, we were gonna to try to pass something by the end of May 
so that we could get the consul's office to take a good look and make sure we were uh, that they were with us and we were all ready to go. That's right, correct? Yeah, correct, you're correct. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yes, yeah, so uh, we were prepared to do that. And um, the reason is, is that uh, we had really put our foot on the accelerator to say, you know, in the environment uh, that we were living, meaning we looked back and had all those conditions uh, precedent that I was mentioning before, as well as looking into the future of an economy that was mostly uh, stable and a community that wants to continue to grow. Uh, what, what would we need to do to continue that growth uh, on the one hand. On the other, I think uh, Mayor Cooper had an appetite to slow down uh, some portions and uh, say, hey, uh, do we really need to do the, the same things in the community that we have done in the past? And particularly with regard to economic incentives and, and so forth that were you know, pretty controversial on his campaign trail and then uh, on into the current day. Uh, so we were bringing around a budget that would uh, you know, fit his priorities. But uh, to your point, as we came into March, um, a tornado and a pandemic pandemic really changed those assumptions and, and not for the better. Uh, we were the most concerned with a pandemic that if uh, it looked like the economy would slow greatly, how would that impact us? And uh, the most impact, of course, would be on our activities taxes, uh, sales taxes being uh, the biggest part of those. And from a uh, timing standpoint, uh, when those tornadoes hit and the pandemic began, we had just finished a big period of collections uh, from property taxes. Uh, that you know, first quarter of the calendar year is when most of those roll in. So we were doing well from a treasury standpoint, but looking at uh, activities taxes, we realized a great number of those in the spring and summer here uh, in Nashville because of our tourism and uh, just the general uh, consumer patterns. And so if those were to drop, and they have dropped significantly, uh, we were very concerned that uh, the taxes, uh, property taxes, and other things that we had in mind just may not work. So um, I advised the mayor, and he very quickly decided, let's take another month and, and be as thoughtful as we can about that. Uh, but during that period, uh, we asked about the comptroller and trying to get this done by, by May. Uh, we had asked, and they had very uh, graciously um, and aggressively tracked along with us uh, week by week since the beginning of the year. And so it came as no surprise to them, that delay, um, and they're pushing for to make sure we stick to the new timeline. All right. So um, we're going to, we'll get into the budget in just a minute. But so take us um, through, the, through basically, you know, so you're preparing for, to give us a budget at the end of March. Here come the tornadoes and here comes the pandemic. What was going on? What was the thought process? What did you all have to do immediately? I know that you went to the mayor and obviously you needed the extra time. I'm sure he probably would have wanted even more time than, than uh, end of April. But what, what did you all have to then redo? What then all of a sudden did you have to start thinking through because you had a budget due all of a sudden now, again, by the end of April, completely different set of circumstances and you didn't have a lot of time to get ready for it. What did you all have to do? What was the focus? What did your staff have to do? All that type of stuff. Yeah, so, you know, and today, now that we're, you know, roughly 10 weeks or so into this pandemic, we think a lot about revenue forecasting, things are in the news today, but at the time, uh, our eyes were mainly on uh, what it would take just to rise to meet each crisis. Um, the mayor, of course, concerned about the health and welfare of the community as a whole. Uh, my client the world, of course, focused on how are we going to pay for that? Uh, for a short period of time, uh, we had cash um, from property taxes and other places in the government that, you know, we weren't about to, to run out of it anytime soon, but we couldn't, you know, uh, rely on it forever. And so uh, as the mayor really focused on uh, taking care of the community, I started to focus on the expense side of it and trying to get our arms around what would a a short term and a prolonged period look like, and then start to do some revenue forecasting, uh, working a bit with the state, economists, and so forth to say, uh, how big may that revenue loss be? And ultimately said over a roughly year, year and a half period, it could be a half a billion dollars or so. Uh, but early on, we had no idea, I still know, uh, how long it would last or how deep uh, it would be. So really turned to the revenue forecasting more than anything. And as the month progressed, um, I thought the mayor just did a marvelous job of setting his 
priorities, uh, I should say resetting his priorities um, to take care of the, of the community. And so the budget we have now really is a reflection of that. And uh, I think if we can get past uh, this economic downturn and past some of this crisis, he'd very much like to return to those, those priorities. Okay, so the forecast, that's part of your responsibility is to try to figure out, you know, um, not only, I mean, obviously we were, we started suffering in March and we've had it through this, this fiscal year and it shows up in terms of how we're having to deal with stuff and what we have to replace. Um, but you're also, part of your responsibility is to figure out next year, what, what does it look like? What is the, the economic forecast? Um, obviously we have never lived through anything quite like this. So you're having to figure out how much revenue are we gonna are we gonna have coming in? How much are we basically not going to get due to this thing? What goes into trying to make a decision like that? What did you have to look at? And then how did you ultimately come up with the idea? It's like okay, so we're gonna lose this much money. This is what we think is gonna happen. Yeah. So um, first thing I think is uh, just to admit that uh, no one uh, has a great answer to that right now for all the reasons that you just mentioned. And so I think flexibility is key. And um, I have another expression I like to use a lot to measure and to manage and to do that with a great deal of frequency. So um, at the beginning of this, uh, we looked uh, pretty closely at what would happen if the economy really slowed down and stay at home. Uh, environment really came around for uh, just the last quarter of this fiscal year. I think you were year ends on June 30, so our, this be our fourth quarter of the fiscal year, and essentially think that uh, our activities taxes would would really drop significantly, much as you know 70, 80 percent, and say that may be our worst case scenario. Uh, well, what would make a better case? Uh, one would be if the pandemic was short lived. Um, the other one would be what. Uh, you know, economists really call a substitution effect, meaning if uh, we didn't have tourists, for example, downtown, and even us locally that go to the symphony or other venues, the zoo, what have you, um, would you instead, though, be spending money at home? Uh, would you be going to Kroger? Would you be uh, heading out to Amazon? And if so, at what rate? And what's that going to look like? And that results in some better cases. So week by week, uh, month by month, as we're getting into this, we're starting to see that, uh, you know, uh, we have had substitution. Uh, things may not be uh, as bad as our worst case scenario, but I can tell you just in the last 48 hours, as I, I look at reports rolling in from across the nation on the economy, it's encouraging to see that uh, there's a, a big appetite to return to work. I think most people want to be back to work and not relying on relief, sorry, relief programs. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I read yesterday the, the bankruptcy tally of big brand names, uh, J. Crew, Hertz, JCPenney, big household names. And, you know, those are consumer driven companies. And those are less encouraging signs that we're going to climb out of this quickly. So uh, where we've landed right now is very similar to where the state is, is that we're expecting uh, this last quarter of our fiscal year to be pretty bleak on that and hopefully start to climb out of that um, in the year or two ahead. Uh, we don't expect that to be a fast climb out and to reach you know, the big economic uh, engine that we had uh, just a few months ago. Uh, we don't expect to get there quickly, but we are expecting to, to start to climb out of this as people change their, their patterns. Okay, so let's talk about the budget that's actually um, before the council right now. Uh, there's a, uh, a public hearing for the budget in front of the Metro Council is June the 2nd, uh, this coming Tuesday at 630. Uh, people can come or they can call. Uh, we've got it both ways. Um, you know, we're going to make sure people proper, you know, practice proper social distancing and, and all that. So we're going to get a lot. We, we're hearing from people right now who are very concerned about a, a dollar property tax uh, proposal. Um, and, um, you know, particularly in a time of a very, a di very difficult time. But tell people who are watching who may not have had the chance to kind of go through the budget, what's in it? You know, it's a $2.4 billion budget. Uh, I, I kind of refer to it sometimes as a status quo budget because, um, you know, even though we're talking about a dollar property tax increase, and we'll talk a little bit about the substitutes that may come after that, after we answer this one, but, um, you know, it doesn't, <laughs> it's basically trying to get us back to even in many ways and get those fund balances back up. Tell us, uh, tell people just generally what's, what's in the budget 
and what goes into you know why the dollar property tax increase is being recommended. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I've heard two characterizations of this uh, budget generally, and, and they're both correct. Uh, one, as you say, is a status quo budget or a, a sustainability budget, which says we need to maintain our metro government uh, services at roughly the same amount that we have today. And I think uh, for those that uh, have been keen observers of the metro government for a long time, uh, they will know that uh, in the last few years, the government has taken big steps to um, cut the fat, as the saying goes, and become a rather streamlined government. So um, we could always make improvements, always do things better. I think that we always will. But as we look across the metro government, uh, the services that we were providing prior to uh, COVID and this downturn are very much needed, if not more so, during uh, the same, same period. And uh, as we look at the obvious health services and so forth, uh, we're going to see some inflation here. And by that, I don't mean just general inflation, but rather inflation and cost because we, we have more services we need to provide. And that takes us to the other characterization of this budget. Mm -hmm. That it's a it's a crisis budget that we have to rise up and, and meet the crisis and a lot of ways that uh, that the general public may not think of as quickly as they think of hospitals and, and healthcare at this moment and uh, wrapped into the crisis component of it uh, is really uh, what you just mentioned and that's our fund balances meaning you know, how much cash and, and reserve do we have for uh, these so-called rainy days. And I think we've seen now with uh, all the tragedies in front of us that uh, we cannot be slow to build those balances because we really might need them. Uh, so far, we have scraped by and we've done okay through this, uh, this moment, but that is not sustainable. And so as we look, as you mentioned, at the dollar tax increase, um, that was a, a painful, painful calculation for the mayor. Uh, certainly not something he wanted to do. And I'm confident our taxpayers don't want to, to see us bring around, but uh, we can't really rise up to the crisis, nor can we build those fund balances in case this is prolonged uh, really any other way right now. Is the, is the um, so you, you had to look at, you know, where we were last year, what we had in terms of the departments, you know, we're talking about schools, police, fire department, just the basic functions of what a government does. You have this giant unknown decrease in what we expect in terms of the revenues coming in. Um, you certainly had some things on the table that you had to meet. And then because you had to use a lot of the money in the fund balances to just try to make it, um, is it, is it, is it a simple way of trying to explain a very complicated process to say, we wanna keep city government functioning the best way possible. We had to make up the shortfall to keep it going. And at the same time, um, you basically, because we are depleting our fund balances, and I know the state calls it the, the rainy day fund, but we are dipping into that just to be able to pay our bills basically. Um, so what you're trying to do is get us back to just keep us functioning at our regular level, but also replace the money in the fund balances that we've had to use so that if, if in October, November, we run into another serious crisis, we've got money sitting there. It's like having a piggy bank that you're ready to break into if you have to have it. Yes. That's, that's pretty simple, but is that a, a kind of an easy way of trying to explain it to people? Yes, I think that's uh, very accurate. And uh, one thing I would emphasize uh, there is that you know, local governments in the state of Tennessee really have three ways that they can bring in money to do that. Uh, they, of course, have property taxes. Uh, we have sales taxes. And then we've also got um, you know, fees that we charge for tourism and Airbnb and you know, various things. And right category is just not very big and even if we you know doubled that amount of money it still wouldn't be you know a significant bump for us uh, and that leaves us the other two and with sales taxes uh, dropping as significantly as they have and hopefully they come back to us we don't know that that really just leaves us with the property taxes is our biggest most sustainable lever here uh, one of the things I like to emphasize in talking to folks about this is that um, 
we need to raise that, um, as the mayor suggested, and I know uh, some of the substitute budgets would suggest raising even more, um, and I think it raised hearts in the right place there, uh, but it doesn't have to be forever. Uh, if our economy comes back uh, faster and stronger, uh, actions can be taken to lower that rate or to uh, look for money some other way, but to your point earlier, we need to sustain this government uh, it needs to be the status quo because unlike a business, uh, we can't fail. Uh, when I've taken corporations, big ones and small ones through uh, restructurings, uh, there is some possibility we won't make it and they will fail. And you know, there's other competitors and so forth that can rise up and take their place. And that's just not true uh, for a local government. Uh, we are here to serve and to serve our people, serve them well. Yeah, we, 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 we don't have the, we can't fail. We have to, this is our responsibility. Um, okay, so the big question, um, usually I wait until about 20 minutes to kill, but the big question is, um, and uh, I think the uh, comptroller has just signed on, so uh, um, make sure we <laughs> tailor our questions. He always sends in a question. His, his question this time was, uh, why is the comptroller so much better looking than the Metro Finance Director? you don't have to answer that. Uh, well, with age comes beauty. And so um, I think he's got me there. He does have you there. That's a very good answer. I like that. Not by much. All right. So, all right. so having said, um, having said kind of the process that went into making up the Metro budget and having said, okay, here's what we've got. Again, uh, before we get to talking about what may be on the table from the council itself, I think a lot of people are interested and we get questions like this. It's like, okay, so, you know, you're projecting next year, you're projecting something that we don't know. You've got things opening back up. Um, we're obviously in phase two. If you watch the news, tourists are starting to come back, you know, not in giant droves. And I haven't seen a bachelorette party um, in a couple of months, but you know, the idea is what happens, you know, you're watching just like everybody else. You're watching uh, the news. Um, and, um, you know, we're waiting for news about vaccines. We're waiting for better safeguards and all that other stuff. Tell, tell the people watching, if, if things somehow got miraculously better, you know, we have to pass a budget by the end of June. Okay, but what happens in July or August and how much time do we have uh, to keep watching this? So if something happens, if the federal government obviously all of a sudden gives us stimulus money, you know, if they come, come up with another supplemental, if somehow there's a miracle cure, if somehow the summer all of a sudden kills this thing, you know, something we didn't know, how quickly can we turn the budget? Uh, I know people aren't even the mayor says uh, he's not happy with a property tax increase of a dollar. Um, you know, so I guess the question is people going like, okay, we understand what you're doing. You've got to, you've got to plug these holes and you've got to keep us going. But are there things that you're going to be watching for over July and August and September that may change the overall budgetary picture? Yeah, we will. And um, I know you, in all seriousness, mentioned uh, Comptroller Wilson's uh, joined and uh, really his office has provided a lot of leadership on this front by encouraging local governments across the state to um, work with the best information they have um, in their hands now, um, pass structurally balanced budgets, um, raise fund balances if you need to, and and uh, just be responsible stewards of your locality, uh, but get that done by June, uh, meet those uh, obligations at law, but then be watchful, work with the state, and um, as we see new activity arise, whether it's the economy coming back uh, faster and stronger, as you mentioned, uh, if there are more relief packages, or frankly, for the money we've already received, those guidelines continue to change, and, and they have, they've changed a lot in the last few weeks, and we can apply those monies um, in place of a tax increase and you know the burden on the people, uh, the ball means be prepared to do that. And so control has obviously been very encouraging uh, on that front. And, and I think that's right for the reasons I mentioned earlier. We need to measure and manage, measure and manage at a faster pace than we ever have before. So um, how fast, I know that um, I think by law, the, uh, the new tax rates have to be sent out I think October the 5th, I believe that's right, something like that. So how fast, um, 
for the, after after a budget is either passed by the council or the mayor's budget becomes law, um, I know that everybody's going to be interested in watching over the next several months. So again, you're watching, we're watching, the public's watching, everybody's watching to try to figure out, okay. So if somebody were to come up and say, okay, so, you know, the council ended up passing a dollar property tax increase at the recommendation of the mayor. Um, people would say, all of a sudden we get a, a supplemental package, uh, something that comes in from the federal government. The question to you is, and working in conjunction with the comptroller's office and then ultimately the council, could the rate change if something dramatically happened between the end of June and the passage of a bus budget and then sometime, you know, let's say in September? Yeah, so the um, uh, property uh, bills really go out there towards the end of September or October. I forget the exact uh, date by which they need to be finalized and actually prepared for mailing. Uh, I know Councilman Mendez has been doing some work uh, to get to an exact date because I think he recognizes on behalf of that budget finance committee this, this very thing. And so uh, I would say we would need to be making some decisions uh, for a change uh, by the middle of August, maybe late August, depending on what the exact date is for printing and processing those, those bills to go out. Okay. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. And, you know, I don't think anybody listening should think that something is going to happen, but we don't know. I mean, you, you said it yourself, every day is a new day. You just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's coming out of Washington. Uh, I know you're working with the state. We don't know what's happening overall from a health standpoint. Um, this thing could come back with a vengeance in the summer and impact our revenues even more. Um, and, or it could come back in the fall. So we, we just don't know. So I appreciate your answer on that. All right. So, um, so you know this and I know this because we're keeping an eye on it, but for the people watching, um, again, budget comes in front of the Metro council for second reading on Tuesday night. There are, um, four proposed, um, substitute budgets being submitted by the by certain council members council member mendez bob mendez is the chairman of the budget committee this year and traditionally he always has one and i know if you if you look in the paper today there's a pretty good explanation of he's looking at two different scenarios um can what can you tell us about the sub the the budget substitutes and how they kind of come into play i know some of them one is higher than than council member Mendes is, and I think two are lower. So we've got, actually, we'll have five in the mix if you count uh, the Mayor Cooper's budget. What can you tell us about them and, you know, and I don't know. I mean, obviously the council is gonna have to sort through this as well, but obviously they've been working with your office to try to figure this stuff out. Yeah, they have, and um, I really committed to the council that uh, as we went through this uh, process that uh, each of the council members that bring forward a substitute really need to speak for themselves and advocate for their position, and that uh, at least for my office, we wanted to be as fair and even-handed in providing information uh, as we can. So uh, I'll limit my comments here to the things that they've said publicly or things that are, you know, sure. obviously known. Um, so let me first part, was saying uh, with respect to the mayor's budget, um, I would not have signed that unless I thought it was a very good budget uh, to begin with. I think the mayor's just done a marvelous job of um, uh, reprioritizing, you will, to rise up to this crisis. And uh, as we've said so many times, he doesn't want to do this tax increase any more than anyone else. But uh, a dollar turned out to be a good number for modeling purposes. And uh, really, as we looked at it, a few pennies on either side of that, we can make a good case for, you know, meeting those uh, reprioritized uh, objectives. And so, as I think about the substitutes uh, that have been offered, uh, I think about them the same way. I uh, mentioned uh, Councilman Mendez, who's quite public now on his website and so forth um, with his proposals. Um, he would bring the uh, the rate high as well as to. Um, add money to things that he believes are, are community priorities. And you know, that's one view. He's uh, also talked in a similar fashion about uh, going with the, the dollar uh, that the mayor's proposed, but perhaps some different priorities within that. So um, I think he is uh, very well intended. Uh, seems to be thinking a lot about the communities he always does. So um, I think that's a, a good approach. And uh, 
I think he and the mayor may come together on, on those. Uh, likewise, uh, there is one with a higher tax rate still, and I can say the same things about it, it's just a different number. Uh, and then there's one uh, that's coming that's substantially lower than that, that uh, I think also is well intended, but um, so far I haven't seen that that meets the requirements yet to restore our fund balances and things that um, I think are gonna require some very prudent fiscal management. And I may get surprised between now and Tuesday that could have been uh, different than it has so far, but uh, right now I, I think that the two that are right there close to the mayor are the most, uh, most viable. Okay, let me ask you a question, and you may or may not be able to answer this. I know there's another substitute that actually, and people ask and said, well, why can't we just borrow the money? Uh, why can't we, you know, instead of hitting the taxpayers with a dollar increase, then there's some mechanism to borrow the money and pay it back at some point. Um, what's the answer to that? Yeah, so the most talked about scenario there has been with regard to the uh, municipal lending fund, uh, which is, again, I, I use the word well intended a lot. There's, despite the disparity of opinions across the board, there, I think, great intentions a lot of places and our federal government I think is uh, intended to uh, work through the treasury and bring a, uh, a lending fund uh, about that would uh, essentially lend money to communities that really uh, don't have any other source of cash flow at this moment. And so uh, I refer to them at this moment really as a lender of last resort. And the way those rules have been set up is that if you had a community, and I'll just use Nashville as if we were in this position, uh, if we had really run our fund balances down to, to zero, if we couldn't find relief anywhere else, and we couldn't borrow any money, and we were you know, essentially going to have to stop services altogether and be able to uh, you know, not serve the people, or at least be in the community of that, uh, this fund is set up for communities like that. Uh, we are not in that position today. Uh, in fact, uh, we can uh, continue to borrow money. I'm uh, thrilled to say, I'll probably wind up saying more about it as the budget proceeds. We've actually been able to renew our investment grade bond ratings. Um, that's not a license to go out and borrow a whole lot more money, but it's a license to do uh, some and to work with our existing lenders and uh, you know continue to uh, to have credit worthiness. Um, I don't think that'll last very long if we're not successful in raising our revenues and doing the other things we talked about here uh, today. But uh, that lending fund just uh, is not one that we qualify for. Uh, if those rules change, uh, just like anything else, uh, we'll be delighted to take a look at that and provide some relief if it looks like that's a good way for us to go. But at this moment, we just don't don't qualify for it. Okay. Uh, very significant that you were able to hold on to those bond writings. That's very, very important. So that's great. That's, Thank that's you. Very that important. A lot yeah. of work by our office. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let me let me ask you. Uh, there's a couple questions coming in. So I know that. Um, I mean, the dollar property tax increase is a big deal. Okay, got that. But um, and so again, you know, it's not like you know you're proposing it and then lots of things are being spent. You're basically getting us back so that we're operating where we're supposed to be with fund balances. Uh, school, uh, the school, um, Metro schools got what, like 400,000 extra dollars just to keep them at their status level. Is that about right? Did I say that right? Yeah. So the, um, the situation with the schools is this, is that um, the state has a uh, law, uh, which is generally called the maintenance of effort. And um, it's, there's a lot of details to it, but just generally stated what it means is, is that a community like ours needs to take its school budget every year and uh, keep it the same or greater than the year before. And that's really a budgetary concept. Um, the underlying cash flow and the revenue streams that bring around that cash flow is a little bit different and there's changes that you need to make when those uh, come around. But by and large, uh, like the rest of the government we described earlier, uh, we've kept the school budget uh, essentially flat. Um, the schools are correct when they say that feels a lot like a cut because they have some inflationary pressures as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we're, we're trying to be even handed and looking at the whole metro government keeping the status quo. So uh, much like the schools, the metro government's made uh, more than 200 million and, and uh, changes, cuts and delays of its own as well. So we, we feel like we're being very fair in proposing that, that flat budget uh, to the schools. Okay, so take that. And that's kind of where the question comes from. It's like, okay, so you're dealing with a major, significant major property tax increase. But some people would say, well, 
you know, schools are already hurting. We, we need more money in the schools. There's some other things that we should be doing. I know you took the, you've got 10 million in for the Barnes Fund that, re that puts it back to the 10 million every year. But I think the, the question is, did you all consider raising it even a little bit more to try to figure out or try to help some specific areas during this crisis? How did you all kind of just settle on the dollar? You, you sort of touched on it, but that's the question that's coming in. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting how that played out. Uh, we really started, uh, and I say we, there was a lot of math going on in my office, as you might expect, to say, what, what do we do if we just try to maintain the status quo? Um, what do we do if we see some relief uh, that comes? And, and it did. It came in uh, from CARES and uh, came to a few other pockets of the metro government as well. And, you know, as we started to model that, um, things were hovering around a dollar for reasons of their own. And so at some point from a modeling uh, perspective, you got to pick a number and start saying, okay, what about these decisions and what specifically those mean, uh, including uh, just looking at headcount uh, for public works or headcount for my own department or what have you. And so as we, we worked around that dollar, it became a nice model uh, for reasons of its own. We, you know, didn't really pick a whiteboard one day, put a dollar on it and say, what can we do with that? But rather, we were in that ballpark. And so, again, as I look at the council proposals are rolling in that are, um, you know, within a, a relevant range of that, I shine very favorably on those and, and respect very much what those council people want to accomplish with it. Okay. Let me, uh, okay. So we've got, um, well, we've got about 15 minutes left. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some of the questions that have popped up and that were sent. Um, and, and maybe go back to a couple of different things. So uh, let me ask you, let me ask you this. So um, the fund balance is obviously something that is, uh, that is pretty important to this budget. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that the, the council got visited by the controller who was on the call, um, concerned about the stability and what we've been doing with the Metro budget. So um, go back again and explain to everybody, the fund balances are, that's part of the reason that the property tax increase is a dollar. That's important to this budget to get some cash into, um, to have it there in case we need it. Maybe um, explain the significance and then maybe, um, oh, uh, the, I guess the follow-up question would be, is it enough? We may not know that, but it's obviously getting us back. You know, you can look at statistics with other cities and we are way low in terms of having cash flow and having that. But again, significance of what it is, why we have it. And then two, why did we pick that number? And, uh, you know, we, I guess we hope and pray that it's going to be enough. Yeah, so um, quite a bit goes into that thinking. Uh, first of all, uh, with respect to picking the number, it goes back to some modeling. Uh, we as a metro government have policies related to fund balances, and uh, those policies uh, really pertain to our general fund balances as well as our school balances. And as you know, Jim, there's a, a lot of different funds inside the metric government, but when we think of our major funds and the bulk of our money, um, they're really uh, spread across six funds and our, our general fund, our debt service, and our, and our schools. And uh, what our own policies say, which date back to the 1990s, is that 5% uh, of our uh, budget expenditures each year need to be kept in a, in a fund balance. And uh, we hear that fund balance called different things at different times. Um, you'll hear it called a reserve. You'll sometimes even hear that called the rainy day fund, and meaning, you know, what are you going to fall back on if you're wrong about your budget, uh, whether that's just bad forecasting or just something bad happens to you. In the meantime, do you have a little cushion? <laughs> you know, the way I think most responsible people try and run their, their households when they can. And so those policies have been on the books a long time and uh, they're easy for us to point to. They're easy for our, the comptroller, as you mentioned, others to point to. And so that's really become our target uh, for this moment. Um, this year, those numbers come out to be really close to $100 million. Uh, by the end of this fiscal year, we won't really have very much fund balance left. Um, and so we are attempting to restore those to uh, those policy 
limits now. Um, interesting, the way we've done it this period is that um, it is 5% uh, for everything except for schools. Uh, what the mayor's propose is that schools can actually be at 4%. Uh, but the reason is, is that extraneous to our budget, uh, they are also receiving $26 million in CARES. Okay. From an and the $26 million, do they get to figure out how to spend that? Uh, so there's guidelines from the federal government as to how they spend it. And uh, I'm right at this moment waiting for a bit of an opinion on how much that goes to um, our uh, general schools versus uh, there's a component that may flow to the charter schools as well. And then the federal government, of course, wants that money spent for relief efforts. And, you know, uh, as the saying goes, not just on problems you already had. And I think they're probably gonna get more flexibility on that last point than uh, we are with the other CARES money that's come in. But, you know, all in economically, I think the schools fund balances and, and cash available to them really will be roughly the same as the metro government as we go this route. Okay. Um, Tell me about um, the, uh, well, okay, the, the next, uh, so next year is a reappraisal year, okay? So have any idea how that's going to play out or is that just something that we have to wait and see? So uh, there's a lot of opinion about that. Uh, my view is that it is wait and see. And uh, the reason I believe that is that uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it, it just, academically doesn't work to say we're about ready to see high unemployment and dropping consumer spending and bankruptcies and so forth. At the same time, look around and say, you know, Nashville and Davidson County is going to continue to see this nice increase in its uh, property values every year. So uh, my view is we need to wait and see. Okay. All right. What about um, tax breaks for uh, older Nashvilleans, seniors? What can yeah, you so yeah, so we have a few of those. Uh, I've uh, not been deeply immersed in those, but the uh, Metro Trustee's Office, Assessor's Office, um, even Health uh, Health Department, uh, there are relief programs available, um, generally known the tax freeze, tax relief, tax deferral, and um, you can go right onto the Metro website. Go, uh, I think particularly the Trustee's Office does a nice job. Um, see those links and, and see what it takes to qualify for those programs. Okay. Um, what about um, what about um, tax breaks for small businesses? Any, uh, you know, particularly businesses that are hurting right now. I know a lot of the money is coming from the federal government, um, and people can qualify hopefully for some of that. Any was there any discussion about whether there was anything we could do to help small businesses? Yeah, there has been. I think the mayor's, you know, very concerned about that. Um, you know, we as a local government uh, really don't have mechanisms uh, in the normal course to uh, to provide those breaks at this moment. I think certainly something we'd be interested in uh, for the longer term. But, you know, for the here and now, um, it looks like some of the CARES dollars that have flowed to us um, may be eligible for that. Um, again, much like the schools, we're still, like every other community, looking for the guidelines uh, for it, but I know the mayor's anxious to see something like that come around. And uh, I think as you're aware, he's uh, forming a non-member uh, group to really govern um, how those monies are gonna be spent. And I know that in working with him, this is gonna be one of his, uh, one of his priorities. Okay, um, had a question about impact fees, which we don't necessarily control. Um, but so the question was kind of a two-part question. It was, Okay, so we've had so much development, so many new houses, so many things going on. Um, you know, you have houses being torn down and three houses showing up. You've got all this stuff going on downtown. How does that play into it? And then um, impact fees, which are, um, which a bill was proposed in the uh, uh, General Assembly to allow us to do that, and it didn't get out of committee. So um, I guess that's kind of a dual question. Yeah, so I'll start with the tail end there. You're right, we're preempted at this moment by state law from doing that. Um, I did testify, and uh, Comptroller Wilson um, you know, helped uh, with that as well, uh, to get an impact fee uh, for Davidson County, since we have that in the surrounding counties, and uh, we weren't asking for anything really more or less than what surrounds us, but uh, the state legislature wasn't inclined to allow us that opportunity. and. Um, in my eyes, I had to let go of that issue and just f focus on the things that really are within our reach and that we're really talking about with this budget today. Okay. Um, I'm checking the chat box to see what else is floating around. Um, 
let's see. Um, there was a question about, is there anything in the budget dealing with uh, immigration? That is something new. I know we have programs in there to deal with it, but is there anything new in the budget regarding immigration? Or, or just helping uh, immigrants in the city as well? Really, uh, there's nothing there that uh, is much different than we've been uh, been doing before. Okay. All right. Um, let me see what else I've got. Um, actually, that takes care of most everything that's come in um, with, I think, um, I think there's um, a new, oh, okay. So there is a question regarding, and um, Brenda Wynn is on the call and she is our county clerk. Um, so in the last, we've got about five minutes left. Um, the dollar property tax increase is, um, it applies to both the urban services district and the general services district. We try to be careful how we always explain this, but if you could take a minute or two and explain uh, how does that work? I know urban services district is more of the core of the city general services district outside. It's a dollar that applies both ways, but can you just explain the basic differences between the two? Yeah, so this is one uh, where I really do wish I had a whiteboard in the back and we could uh, get into the math because I think when you uh, put the math out, it makes a little bit more sense. But um, you described it really well there. Um, you know, the uh, USD, as it's known, the Urban Services District is our core. And uh, then the General Services District, uh, we tend to hear people characterize it as everything but the USD. But, you know, really, if uh, you're in the USD, you're also in the GSD. And so... Yeah. What the mayor has proposed here is a uh, dollar increase in the in the GSD rate, so it would apply to um, everyone in the uh, county. Uh, if we were to look at splitting that rate, which has uh, been done in the past, then um, I think that uh, what gave rise to the USD and the GSD in the first place was differences in services that are provided and the costs that go with that. And so uh, to do that and do it well, we'd probably be looking at doing a cost study of some kind to, you know, say more definitively than we can, you know, just on a simple spreadsheet, um, what would be the right thing to do. Um, here for the short term, uh, $1 for the GSD uh, spreads the peanut butter, as the saying goes, and mm -hmm. um, we decided to go. Okay. All right. So a last big question for you. Um, we get through this budget cycle or we hold on, we get through this. What do you think about the future? I mean, you probably haven't had a lot of time to think through it, but um, to kind of walk us through, you know, okay, so let's say, let's say we pass the mayor's budget. Council passes the mayor's budget, says that it's at a dollar. We, we, there is no federal money coming. The cavalry doesn't come. Um, we, um, you know, we, we just kind of holds through this and then we get on the other side of this thing. Um, what do you, what do you see? What do you see us where we, where we head? Obviously you all, you know, Mayor Cooper came in with lots of different ideas. He brought you in uh, a new team in place with lots of innovations, lots, lots of ideas. And then you get hit with a pandemic. Um, where do you want to see us going? And you've sort of touched on it before with, when you're looking at different studies in terms of services provided and other things like that. Give us, uh, I know you, you got the bond ratings stable. Great. You got other things. What's, what's the good things that are going to come? What are, what are we all going to look forward to as we get through this mess that we're going through right now? Yeah, so I'll give you uh, two answers to that. I'm going to start with one that's uh, not a financial uh, answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're experiencing some really, tough times here. I mean, the financials are one thing, but as you opened up uh, you know, this broadcast a little earlier, uh, we have so much hurt in our community from so many different ways. And I'm really hoping that um, as we uh, make our way to the other side, um, that, that that'll stop and that uh, you know, our community can heal together and uh, become more unified in every respect uh, than we are today. And, you know, from a financial standpoint, uh, when I look at the other side, I'm hoping that that doesn't take us uh, too long to get there. I think by most economists' predictions, uh, that may take a year, two, maybe three years. I've heard uh, you know some testimony that the 
state this week along those lines. But I think what will be great for Davidson County in the midst of all that are the things that have been great with us uh, for quite some time. Um, we've got a very diverse economy in a southern state that is very friendly to, to businesses. And um, I think that over time, we'll need to uh, change the way we do that business. Um, I think we'll certainly need to look at, you know, what's gone well and what hasn't gone well here in Davidson County and, and make adjustments. But um, overall, I think that uh, for the same reasons that the mayor uh, was elected, the priorities that he saw important in terms of bringing that community together, um, as well as trying to provide a sustainable financial future, uh, hopefully that our diverse economy, innovation we've seen here for so long will continue and will be competitive um, as a city as we as we have been in the past all right and so i'll go back to the original question i started with um uh, uh you glad you took this job i am it's uh i'll be frank with you i've never thought about uh being in public service uh not because it was a bad idea i just have enjoyed a, a lot of uh success and uh great times in the uh, corporate world, but uh, this has truly been a pleasure. And more than anything else, just the people I've gotten to know here that I wouldn't have gotten to know otherwise, and uh, a chance to hopefully uh, leave things in uh, as good or better place than uh, they have been. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. All right. Well, thank you for doing the job you're doing. We will have, um, um, obviously we have a public hearing. The Metro Council has a public hearing coming up on Tuesday night on the budget. Budget will be on second reading uh, at the council uh, on um, Tuesday night. People are welcome to come down. Uh, we will follow all um, good health social protocols uh, in terms of social distancing and keeping people six feet apart. And uh, I think the uh, mayor's executive order, uh, I think it's number, maybe number five, um, says that we're supposed to be wearing masks in the courthouse. So that's why you saw us last time with masks on if you're not at your desk. So we'll be there. Uh, we do encourage people to call in. I know people have different issues. Um, we're seeing different, everything from, you know, why don't you, why don't you cut into Metro government um, to, um, you know, maybe we should have an additional few cents to take care of different things. So we'll listen to all that and we do want to hear from people. This is important. This is very important. So that's up on Tuesday night. Um, the budget um, is scheduled for third reading and it is amendable uh, on the 16th of June. We have a, a second specially called meeting on June the 9th. That's where the uh, capital improvements budget is um, passed because I think we have to have, have it passed by June the 15th of every year. So there'll be a, a second extra meeting on the 9th and I will tell you, Kevin, that uh, uh, I hope you attend because we also have um, a number of zoning bills that got pushed to the, that special meeting in June, on June the 9th. I know it's gonna be over 40 zoning bills that have been pushed and probably more than that. And we may be there until three or four o'clock in the morning. So um, um, I will also tell you this, just for those of you who are interested, um, the meeting on the second will be the first meeting that uh, since we're in phase two that we got to more people. So we will actually have members of the budget committee in the chamber on Tuesday night. Uh, we thought that was appropriate. We can't have the entire council, it's too big. We violate the, the phase two guidelines. Uh, but there were 12 members of the budget committee. They were all invited back if they want to, if they feel comfortable coming back. So they will be in the chamber to listen to what's going on as well. Um, so we expect, um, we expect to hear a lot from the public. We hope that's good. Next Saturday, Alex Jahanger, uh, the chairman of the Metro Board of Health is gonna be with us to talk about what else, but um, COVID-19 and the pandemic and what's going on in Nashville. And then in two weeks, uh, we're gonna be joined by uh, the very um, attractive and good looking Justin Wilson, the comptroller of the treasury for the state of Tennessee. And then Kevin, you can ask questions to him and I can uh, ask him questions on the spot. But um, we appreciate you being here. I know you've got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of work's going into this. We've got a lot more stuff happening, a lot of stuff going on in this country. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's been a very difficult time and this weekend is even more difficult with the things going on out of uh, Minneapolis. And uh, again, uh, very, very sad situations and uh, Phil, um, Feel, feel very sad and very 
bad about the whole thing. It, uh, just, uh, it's a tough time. Um, but we need to figure out ways to deal with our issues and we need to figure out how we um, come out better as a whole country. So anyway, um, Kevin, thank you. Have a good rest okay. of the weekend. Uh, we'll see you probably early this coming week because we got budget stuff coming on. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. And uh, again, appreciate everybody's time. Thank you.